Hello, my name is Bird Running Water, and I belong to the Cheyenne and Mescalero Apache Nations. I'm honored to be welcoming you to our reimagined Sundance Film Festival coming from the indigenous lands of North America. I'd like to pay a special tribute to the Ute Tribal Nation, the Lenni Lenape Nation, and the Tongva people. We thank them all for giving Sundance Institute our homes. I would also like to honor the indigenous lands and people from where you are joining us. Please enjoy the show. Ikehet Nahanaka. Good evening, I'm Clark Weens, co-founder and president of the Circle Cinema Board. Welcome to the Circle Cinema and to the Admiral Twin Drive-In, who have something in common. They were both featured in the Tulsa's film of The Outsiders. Welcome also to Sundance Film Festival 2021, hosted by your Circle Cinema, Tulsa's non-profit theater. We thank you always for your attendance, especially during the pandemic, your safety comes first. Circle Cinema opened in 1928, 93 years old, and is looking forward to its 100th birthday. Community conscious through film, the Circle motto, is well supported by the independent films that the Sundance Film Festival brings to the world. Having the festival here in Tulsa helps to complete that circle. Historically, Circle Cinema has worked with many other nonprofit organizations to bring awareness to their mission and to work with them to make Tulsa a better place to live. In keeping with that tradition, Circle Cinema is donating 100% of proceeds from the Sundance general admission tickets to the 1921 Race Massacre Centennial Commission. And we'll work with them to facilitate actions, activities, and events that commemorate and educate all citizens. Thanks again for your, all your support in keeping the circle part of Tulsa's culture now and in the future. everyone and welcome to the Native American Filmmakers panel presented by Cherokee Nation Film Office for the Sundance Film Festival satellite screen. Uh, we're coming together for this panel from all over the country due to the global pandemic and as Sundance has for the first time ever partnered with independent cinemas across the country including the Circle Cinema in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, I'm your moderator slash panelist today. Uh, my name is William J. Hugh Garut. I'm a citizen of Cherokee Nation. Uh, I'm a, a television writer. Um, I've worked on shows for Lionsgate and Showtime, Sony International, uh, most recently coming off of Stumptown on ABC. Um, now I'll go around the Zoom room and we'll have each panelist introduce themselves and uh, tell us what arena they work in, um, and uh, what projects you may be known for. Uh, and we will have full bios up on the website so we can keep this brief and get to the, the nitty gritty soon. Um, but we'll go in alphabetical order by first name. And so we'll start with uh, Billy Luther. Hello, um, my name is Billy Luther. I am Navajo, Hopi, and Laguna Pueblo. I'm currently living in LA. Um, I've been um, in the doc documentary world for um, about 20 years now, I'm transitioning into um, uh, writing and directing my first narrative feature, Fire Red Face Me, which was just at the Sundance uh, Screenwriters and Directors Lab this past year. Um, also have um, a docuseries that uh, we're developing, and that's about the powwow circuit. So really excited about that. 
um, and um, also just really early development in my first doc, uh, Miss Navajo, which I'm developing into a feature. Nice. Fantastic. All right, uh, Jeremy. Um, Lucio, Jeremy Charles Davido, um, Cherokee Nation here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm a writer, director, producer, and uh, have a production company, a native owned company called Fire Thief Productions. And we do uh, a lot of documentary work. And um, but here in the last couple of years, I've kind of pivoting back to narrative work and uh, trying to uh, get a few development um, ideas to a couple of TV series and films uh, in, in production. That's kind of um, taking the chance from COVID uh, to kind of uh, do some development. Excellent. Uh, Kyle. Hello. My name's Kyle. I'm from Oco Creek from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am a filmmaker, make documentaries. Um, just got into filmmaking around 2015, so I've been doing it for about five, going on six years now. Um, in 2019, I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of the Sundance Native Filmmakers Lab and uh, you know they helped me with the writing and uh, getting my first short narrative made uh, this past year so uh, later this year um, yeah you know uh, just transitioning to narrative now and uh, also you know very fortunate and lucky enough to be a uh, and a part of the Rolex mentorship program, uh, being mentored by uh, Spike Lee in New York. So, yeah. Amazing. Uh, welcome, Elamaya. Uh, we were just going around and, and introducing ourselves sort of quickly, mentioning some of the projects people might know us from. Um, if you want to hop in and, and introduce yourself. Um, Ganas ya samis, um, ya dal monorun, uh, musquium squamish slave tooth, uh, londus. Um, hi, I'm Elamaya Abiniskim Tail Feathers. I come from, uh, Ghana or Kainai. It's part of the Blackfoot Confederacy, and I'm also Sami from Northern Norway. Uh, I'm a filmmaker based in, uh, Vancouver, which is the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, and I've been making films for almost 10 years. Um, my most recent feature film, The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, uh, premiered at Berlinale. And um, I co-wrote and co-directed that with Kathleen Hepburn. Um, and I was lucky enough to be the 2018 um, Sundance Metathenta. Film Fellow, which is a wonderful experience. Um, and I'm currently one of the, the um, Indigenous Intensive Lab Fellows. And yeah, it's an honor to be here. Fantastic. Uh, so glad that we could all come together. I think this is very cool. Um, the panel is scheduled to last up to an hour. So we're going to go ahead and, and get started. Um, and instead of calling on specific panelists to answer specific questions, uh, we'll open up the floor for just a more freeform discussion on everything. Um, if you don't f have anything to weigh in with, don't feel like you need to. If you do speak, please don't hesitate. Um, so uh, without spending too much time on this topic, because we have more positive things that we'd like to, to get to and focus more on, um, we do want to uh, briefly talk about how the pandemic has affected our work. Uh, Jeremy, we're already talking about your, your uh, using this to pivot to development. Um, for, for me, since I, I work in TV, uh, much of TV writing has shifted fairly seamlessly to Zoom. Um, so I now have shorter hours and I work in my home office and it's been good enough that I feel guilty about how good it is. Um, so I will uh, pass the baton to the, the rest of the floor about how it's changed your work. I'll kind of go first. Um, well, you know, we've kind of 
maybe a little bit different scenario than somebody else on the panel, but we have a production company. And uh, as you can imagine, um, production has <laughs> dried up. We were uh, lucky enough to have enough uh, in post-production going on to kind of see us through for a few months. Um, and that really was, we were very, very fortunate for that. Um, we're also able to get some, you know, payroll protection assistance that helped out too. But um, there are some positive things. We all learned how to work on Zoom. We are, everyone's uh, really taken a, uh, um, the initiative and it's really worked out pretty well, people working remotely. As you can imagine, it's a lot of challenges trying to transfer footage back and forth when you're, you know, um, but uh, all, in all, all things considered has been very nice and, and I've been taking the, uh, the opportunity um, the rare little uh, break to to develop some some work. So there's some positive stuff. Yeah, I guess uh, I, I'll just, I'll go next. Um, what's been really um, kind of eye opening is just um, the amount of meetings that are um, able to take place um, during this time. Um, I've noticed that there's been a shift. Um, with just more like open doors um, and I've been taking advantage of those. Um, and it's also really helped in, ter in terms of creative, creatively and um, development and writing, um, you know, just kind of have to, you're forced to kind of stay put and, um, and, and work. Um, you know, it's been these, these projects have, that I mentioned before, I've just been developing, um, you know, since this past March. Um, and, um, you know, I got a manager during this time. So it's all like, all these things are really kind of like exciting, you know, but also, um, you know, when do we get back? When can we go back out in the field and start shooting again? Because it is quite, um, uh, it's, it's still, the numbers are still really high here in LA and um, on, on our, in our communities and our native communities. Um, but um, yeah, I just seen a shift. Um, I just see, like I said, um, just much more more meetings that are happening and open doors. So it's it's, it's really helped. Yeah, to uh, add to what Jeremy said, you know, me and Jeremy worked together, a production company in Tulsa, Fire Thief, and uh, just kind of adapting to you know, working separately. It's just been real. Um, it's been a challenge at times. Uh, you know, even aside from uh, from that, you know, trying to be creative uh, with writing on my own, uh, it's just, uh, you know, sometimes it just fall into these slumps. I don't know. It's just, I guess, just being inside and I get, I guess I get inspired more by being out and around people and listening to their stories. So that's been really tough, kind of being, a, you know, isolated from people. So um, just really trying to watch more older films, uh, read older books. I mean, just trying to do whatever I can to stay inspired. It's kind of been a challenge for me, so. I guess I've been fortunate enough to be um, mostly in post-production on a feature length doc that I've been working on for five years. I mean, it, it drastically slowed everything down. So working remotely was a real pain. Um, so my editor ended up uh, coming out to Vancouver and, and we were able to work in a suite that we'd like sort of built as like a COVID safe ish area. Um, but yeah, working remotely in post has been uh, not fun. I don't want to do it again, but, but we made it work. Um, and then I've been in development on, on my next narrative feature. So yeah, like, like everybody said, it, it's it's kind of forced me to to work creatively at home. Um, but I have to say, I've really appreciated not having to travel constantly because I feel like part of this industry requires like so much travel, and it's been really wonderful to like actually have a routine at home and like a normal day every day. Um, so yeah, I've been I've been grateful for that just to like slow down and have a somewhat like stable normal. Kind of schedule. 
Excellent. Um, well, this this next one is uh, a basic question, perhaps for for a lot of us, but um, we're going to have people in the audience that might not have thought about these issues that are trying to expose themselves to these sorts of of questions. And so, I I wanted to ask why you all think it's important for natives, for indigenous people to be involved in every level of the film and TV industries. Um, for me, it's, uh, it, it's kind of simple in that I didn't know that a lot of these jobs existed. I grew up in small towns and, and uh, away from the Hollywood apparatus. And I didn't realize that TV even had writers until I was 18 or 19 years old. And um, I didn't see stories about modern indigenous people on TV ever. And so when I was learning how to write TV, I thought, oh, well, there's never going to be a market for that. I shouldn't even bother. Um, and by making these jobs more accessible, by having more representation, I think it makes the it, it makes a mystifying industry seem more accessible uh, would be my simple answer to that. But um, how about how about the rest of you? Well, I'll just say that filmmaking is a, um, it's kind of in the DNA and storytelling, you know, in the DNA of human beings. And if you, um, if you don't see an entire race of people represented, the strength of that media is so powerful. This is kind of how it's come to be in this situation we're in. Um, but uh, in order to turn that around and create compassion and create um, empathy between cultures, between peoples, um, that's what filmmaking is good for. You know what I mean? You can really um, show people, um, you know, I think it breeds compassion and, and, it, and it creates um, harmony when people actually have a glimpse into lives of others and also commonalities with others that maybe they hadn't thought of before. Well, I think it also kind of comes down to this larger question of like, what is an indigenous film? Um, and the longer I've worked in the industry, the more I've realized that it's absolutely critical that we have indigenous people working in every department, if possible. Um, there's there's a, a depth of understanding that comes with lived experience that adds um, this beautiful richness to to the decisions the creative decisions that are made um, within every department and film filmmaking is a collaborative process it requires so many people to create uh, to create our work and having indigenous people in all of those departments even you know makeup wardrobe set design all of those things um, help build critical elements of the story that that I guess um, creates a, a broader and very nuanced um, representation of, of who we are because those decisions are being made or influenced by people who actually have lived experience. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been misrepresented for so long on screen um, that it's high time that we actually have Indigenous people working in, in all of these technical capacities because it certainly influences um, what we see on screen. And I think it, it, it only serves to advance the narrative, to advance the work, to heighten the work um, in a way that, that just can't be done by people without that specific lived experience. Um, something off of off of that that it uh, made me think of is uh, the fewer uh, representatives of a community you have on a project, the more responsibility is on the person who is there to get everything right to catch anything that might uh, be a little off. Whereas uh, when you have more people in more positions, uh, you have more people who might say, oh, we probably shouldn't put a dream catcher in a Pacific Northwest reservation. Uh, and it's not all down to, to the one uh, person on the project who can speak to certain things. Um, uh, it, yeah, which will just improve any project if you can avoid those sort of landmines and, and pitfalls. Um, yeah, I, I, 
I agree on that. I think that um, many people think just film is just directing and writing, um, but there's a lot of things that come um, into play. Um, I think it's important that we start, you know, mentoring and um, supporting, you know, composers, costume designers, um, you know, editors. I think it's really crucial set designers, you know, um, like you just said about the dream catcher. Um, I think it's really important to get these people, um, you know, kind of people who are interested in film. Um, there's other, you know, other um, parts to play in filmmaking. Um, you know, I think, you know, it was really, for me, I was trying to find, um, you know, a native editor out here in LA. Um, and that was quite um, difficult. Um, and um, I'm always looking for native composers. And um, I think it's just, yeah, we just need to kind of just kind of widen the net and kind of start finding these people. Um, so uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how the film and TV industries are changing in regards to native representation. Um, and your own personal experiences uh, from the past uh, compared to the present. Um, are you finding that more doors are open than before? And are those doors staying open and translating into real work and, and quality projects? Um, for me, I, I'm not gonna talk too much on this subject because I'm, uh, I believe the, the freshman in the group comparatively. And so uh, for me, I, I started in the industry about three years ago, and um, I have found an incredibly warm reception. I've been very, very fortunate to meet good people um, who want to hear stories and want to help me tell them. And um, yeah, I, I've, I've been blessed, which doesn't necessarily make for an interesting panel answer. So I will uh, uh, open it up again. I guess I'll just go real quick. Um, you know, when I first moved to LA about 20 years ago, it was really difficult. Um, there, you know, a lot of the people who were um, the, the decision makers um, were, you know, um, not, um, you know, person of color. Um, there was a lot of men when I was meeting for my first, um, for my first documentary, the Snabajo, um, that's who I was meeting with was a bunch of um, men, white men, and um, you see things changing now. Um, there's more people um, making these decisions and executives that are um, really trying to find these unique stories. And I find that it's, it's, it's different, you know. Um, we, you know, 20 years ago, it was, we didn't have, you know, a lot of the streamers that we have now. So there's so much content out there and there's so much um, ways to kind of um, distribute your, your work. Um, so it's, I think there's just a, a bigger, a larger opportunity um, for any artist right now. Um, they just really want to find, you know, unique voices and stories. I can tell you from someone, sorry, to interrupt, um, I can tell you that, you know, I kind of got into uh, the narrative world recently and and you guys who are a little bit farther along than me kind of realize like the first door to open is the hardest door to open, right? And like, how can I bust through? But one thing that's uh, that I've found and with my limited experience is that um, it's sort of being decentralized from LA. Like um, people for the first time, you know, I there are fellowships that I can actually take part in that I don't have to live in LA, you know, they're opportunities, um, everyone's realized that remote communication is actually pretty efficient. And, and so the, the, it's why the opportunities of sort of, uh, I think Billy was saying this earlier, have really widened for, you know, the, the entry has, has gotten bigger. Yeah, I am, um, I started as an actor um, quite a few years ago. And the reason I moved into filmmaking was because of um, all of the problematic stuff that I was auditioning for. So much of it was being, in fact, like almost all of it was being made by non-Indigenous people. Um, and 
I just grew really tired of it. So I started making my own work. Um, and like I said, I've been working as a filmmaker for almost 10 years. And I've witnessed a lot of change, especially here on the Canadian side of the border. Um, there's been a lot of activism from within the Indigenous film community to push for, um, for funding initiatives for Indigenous films so that filmmakers can actually make that jump from making shorts to features because that was a, a, a huge barrier. Um, and ensuring that you know, the funding institutions within Canada um, were actually creating opportunities for Indigenous filmmakers. But it's a bit of a double-edged sword because um, one, we're, these, these funding opportunities are, are so important, they're crucial, but they're not giving us, uh, they're not giving us um, the same opportunities that they are giving filmmakers who are mostly white men, who they trust. Um, and the other thing is, is that because we've discovered that there's an audience for Indigenous film, um, there are still a lot of non-Indigenous filmmakers or, or people working within the industry who want to capitalize on Indigenous stories. Um, so I get a ton of requests from, from people who have projects with Indigenous content wanting an Indigenous um, filmmaker involved. Um, and many times uh, they, you know, they come at it with, with good intentions. Um, but the work itself is, is, is so problematic on just like a baseline level. Um, and so I think there's, there's definitely a long way to go in terms of like building stronger relationships within, uh, within the broader film industry between non-Indigenous um, film professionals, filmmakers, production companies, and Indigenous creatives, because there's um, so much talent. There's so many talented Indigenous uh, writers and directors, um, and there's just not enough opportunity. However, we are seeing like a big change on the American side with all of these um, Indigenous-led television shows. Like that's so exciting just in this last year alone, just to see what's happening in, in television. And um, I think uh, these major companies are recognizing again that there's, there's an audience for Indigenous for Indigenous film and Indigenous stories, which is really exciting. Um, and, and I think it has a lot to do with the ways that people are accessing media now, especially. Um, and in Canada, we have um, something that's been like really, really, a really useful tool for Indigenous filmmakers, which is the Indigenous Screen Office. Um, and it was kind of meant to model uh, what they've done in Australia and in New Zealand in terms of um, creating uh, an institution that advocates on behalf of Indigenous filmmakers. Um, and so there's been resources that are, have been created, like the Imaginative Indigenous Pathways and Protocols document, which is um, a, a document that was created alongside uh, so many Indigenous filmmakers within Canada um, to, to, to give especially non-Indigenous people a resource, a, 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 a a toolkit for how to actually engage with Indigenous communities, how to tell Indigenous, not how to tell Indigenous stories, but how to go about supporting Indigenous stories. Because um, fundamentally, I believe that our stories should always be told by us. They belong to us and we need to be the ones leading that narrative. Um, but yeah, there's been a huge shift and, and I have hope, but there's still a long way to go. Um, and. Uh, a lot of a lot of the work that's been done has been um, has been on behalf of or has been has come from the indigenous film film community itself. Um, Kyle, did you want to? Did you have any experiences that you wanted to uh, talk about in in this one? Sorry, I don't mean to put you yeah. on the spot. <laughs> Sorry, I keep cutting out. Um, no, you know, I'm just, I feel like I'm still young in the filmmaking world. You know, I haven't been doing it this long, but from what I see, you know, there is, it's good to see a little bit of change, you know, starting uh, with representation on screen, TV, film. Um, but yeah, you know, I agree with, I feel like the, for me personally, I feel like, you know, telling our own stories, what we want to say is, you know, uh, the best way to push them, um, you know, to get them out. 
out there. Uh, for me personally, that's what I you know, out here, you know, with my tribe, you know, I would like to tell more of those. So, yeah, you know, it's great seeing you know, other uh, Native filmmakers, Indigenous filmmakers, uh, you know, getting representation for us all out there. Yeah, I, I was, I, I, I loved hearing the reference to the the TV shows that are um, coming up. So exciting, like uh, Rutherford Falls and Reservation Dogs and and Spirit Rangers. And one of the things that I think is so exciting about all of these projects is that uh, there's not the we'll find one native and we will put them on the pedestal and they will be the native representation and then we've done it like rutherford falls has a half native writing staff and spirit rangers is a i think entirely but at the very least predominantly indigenous writing staff and so there uh, i i've seen a move away from sort of uh, token representation to a more inclusive, like, oh, you mean natives can have multiple opinions sort of representation. And I think that that is um, incredibly exciting and makes me very optimistic. Um, but speaking of uh, of coming into Hollywood and, and being sort of newer to things, um, we wanted to talk about uh, what kind of opportunities are out there for someone who has little to no experience in the industry, but is wanting to break in and tell indigenous stories. Um, what do you think some of the ways, some of the routes that are available and um, what do you think this space will look like for these people as they come in? Um, a little broad, but I think we all have different paths that we took into here and I think it could be fun to talk about it. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, I, you know, um, this is interesting because I think um, when I started, you know, I just found those, um, there's, there's organizations, um, there are mentorship programs, there are diversity and inclusion programs with every kind of major studio um, that helps nurture writer, directors, um, producers. Um, they're out there. Um, it's not like you can go to one site and find all these, you know, all these, um, you just have to do a lot of homework. Um, and that's really what I did. I, you know, I ran out of money for film school and um, what I, I just started volunteering at Sundance um, Festival. And I was able to work, you know, during my shifts and then meet other filmmakers. Um, and I was, went to films, stayed for Q and A's. Um, it's like film school. Um, panels, went to panels. Um, I just took advantage of all the things that I um, just soak in and take in and met a lot of people. Um, and I took advantage of a lot of these programs too. Um, I, it, they're out there. Um, people, you know, I think it's just like I said, it's, it's just a lot of homework that you gotta do. Um, I think the Sundance, uh, the Native and Indigenous program is a huge, um, you know, resource. Um, and if you don't get in once, you got to keep trying. You know, I tried um, many times um, to get into certain programs with the, with the Institute. Um, but, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of programs out there. And I think it's really exciting to see that they're growing. And um, I have friends that are on, you know, Universal, NBC Universal, um, Universal, um, you know, programs that, you know, help nurture and mentor, have a mentorship program. So um, they're out there. Yeah, uh, I, I came up through uh, the sort of fellowship system. Uh, I was in the LA Skins Fest Native American TV Writing Lab. I was in the uh, um, NBC's Writers on the Verge program. I was in the ABC Disney TV writing program. And uh, Billy, what I loved about your answer is the emphasis that you put on the networking and the community that you discover in these sorts of things. Uh, I, I think there's yeah. a perception that like you get in and then you get a job. And it's, uh, it, yeah. it, it's all about building that network and, and meeting people and forming that community. It is, and you know, I found a lot of my crew through these programs. Um, you know, my DP, editors, um, 
composers, you know, just through going through these programs. Um, and, you know, it didn't, didn't, you know, it didn't hurt either to, you know, go to the festival and start networking too. So people could remember your face. Um, and so when you went in and, you know, either you had a pitch or you had something to say, oh, we danced on the dance floor at Sundance, you know, or, you know, <laughs> like, hey, we were at brunch, remember? Yeah, so it's, it was really cool. And that was really cool because, you know, I, I keep going to my first doc because that's just kind of like always stands out. But, um, you know, I went to HBO to pitch Miss Navajo to them. And although they didn't take it, they were at the premiere, you know, the people that I pitched, you know, are, and also kept them in, in the loop. Um, they're at the premiere of the film at Sundance in, in 2007. So you just kind of have these kind of relationships with people that you, um, it's really, it's, uh, you just keep. And um, yeah, just it's part of networking. It's all, it's all, that's the other side of your, um, your job as a, as a filmmaker is, you know, reading, reading the deadline, you know, deadline to all the trades, you know, that's huge to keep up on all of that. Um, know who's ahead of something or um, you never know because you can, be at Sundance and waiting for the bus and you're like oh shit that's um so and so you know um it's really yeah it's just just finding creative ways to um connect and also with other native and indigenous filmmakers as well I think we're we all know of each other we've all met each other some in some way and I think it's there's a lot of us but it's a it's a small group and and I think it's really cool that we're all supportive of each other I would say, can I add that, um, you know, being here in the Midwest, it, it, it does uh, pose some challenges, right, to your, your networking. Um, what I, what I all, why do I have always done throughout the years is just, just dive in and do it. And while you're, you know, laying the groundwork with networking and you're, you know, building uh, your network and you're trying to get attention, keep working, keep, keep doing, keep doing it. Um, you have to do more than one thing at a time. You know, um, um, if you have one in the can, you should already have one in the hopper, you know, um, that it, having something to show people when you do finally get those opportunities is really, really the most important thing that for me has been. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I would say, you know, as a young filmmaker, I mean, trying to break in to that film world, uh, especially out here where I'm at in Oklahoma, it was really hard as far as connections too. You know, but, um, honestly, there wasn't that many uh, I felt like I'm, I could go to. So it was up to kind of me to pick up a camera and learn how to use it on my own. So I would just suggest you know if anyone's interested in filming uh, anything to that uh, definitely you know work hard at it and there is you know a lot of resources out there though uh, that you can go to and uh, a lot of mentorships you know especially you know like the one Sundance puts on for native filmmakers it was really helpful helpful for me writing my first short script and just seeing it come to life, you know, Sundance has really helped me a lot. That's fantastic. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, last year, the Academy Awards set new inclusion standards for the best picture category. Uh, meaning, for example, a film must have either two leadership positions or six crew from an underrepresented group, uh, including Native Americans. Um, have you seen any changes to inclusion practices based off of this initiative or any sort of like trickle down policies like this? Uh, what are your thoughts on this initiative and its efficacy? I have not unfortunately seen too much of an impact from it just yet. Um, I, I don't know if anybody else has had different experiences with it, but um, I, I haven't quite seen the, the, the trickle down coming, which is weird because trickle down usually works. Um, <laughs> I guess if you're looking to 
qualify for best picture, I guess. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, this, uh, for me, it doesn't necessarily change anything that I'm doing. Um, I think that, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know what to say about it. I mean, it's not necessarily, um, I'm not, you know, every film I make, I'm not trying to win, you know, awards. I just want it to be, you know, the best I can make. Um, you know, when I work with crew, you know, it's docu especially documentary crew. Um, I have, you know, a sound guy and a um, camera guy, and it's just the three of us. Um, and uh, my crew isn't, you know, who, who've worked with me in the past from my first feature to, um, to my um, current docs, um, it's the same crew. And um, they're not native. Um, uh, so I just want to work with who I feel is the best in, you know, a relationship that I already have with them. Um, so, um, I don't know, I can't speak about that, but it's, uh, it is what it is. I certainly have noticed people sniffing around a lot more, you know what I mean? Uh, like you were saying earlier, is like, are there any natives in there that we can, you know? Um, <laughs> but I think just observing is like, um, um, I think that will eventually come out in time. It will come out um, uh, because I feel like there's just, because the system has not included natives for so long that it takes time for, for uh, you know, the filmmakers to get to a level where they are you know, it was like, well, I can't let you produce a Marvel movie if you've only done this, you know. So I think that's part of the problem that I'm seeing um, just personally. Yeah, I think, um, I think Billy touched on something, which is that there's kind of a, maybe a bit of a disconnect between that world and, and you know, independent films being made by indigenous creatives. Um, that being said, I think uh, it also comes down to the Academy membership and that's being changed slowly. But, um, you know, the people that get to choose who wins um, also need to, to reflect the, the diversity of, of the population out there that's actually consuming, consuming these films and this media. Um, and so I don't think we're gonna see substantial change until the voting membership um, accurately reflects the population. Um, and yeah, I, I also have noticed um, there's been sort of some changes in terms of mentorship and training programs, which are really important, but can also be done so poorly if they're not um, executed in the right way. Um, when it's when it's kind of just like considered like a diversity box to to check um i feel like it can be really damaging for emerging indigenous creatives to to um find themselves on these on these large productions on these large sets and then just sort of feel i guess alienated um and not actually be treated in a way that's like engaging and generative for them as as creatives and for for you know a long um successful career in the industry and so i really hope to see that change um i hope to see uh productions really having more of a, a rigorous approach to, to training and mentorships um, that extend beyond just having, you know, like, like a certain number of indigenous creatives on set. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a long way to go. And I can't say that I've seen a huge shift in terms of those inclusion standards. I think it's going to take a long time to sort of undo decades and decades and decades of white supremacy within the film industry. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question that's maybe a little abstract, but we'll, we'll see what, what comes of it. Uh, but how do you define good representation in your works? Uh, what is a good native role? Um, and the reason why I wanted to ask that question is because it's something that I constantly wrestle with of uh, my, the responsibility that I feel to 
uh, give positive portrayals of underrepresented people and try to correct some damaging narratives. Uh, that impulse is always wrestling with my impulse to tell stories that I know are true. And I know some jerks who happen to be Cherokee and trying to balance uh, those competing instincts is, is something that I wrestle with. And I wanted to know where you guys fall on, on sort of that uh, issue that we're always struggling with. I, well, for me, my my primary audience and who I make my work for is is most always my community, uh, whether that be Kainai or or my Sami community. Um, and I feel I think this is something that most Indigenous filmmakers feel, which is which is a deep responsibility to to my community first and foremost. Um, and then in terms of representation, I think if I can show my community something um, where they feel seen and heard in an authentic way, um, then that is that is authentic representation or, or good representation, as you said. Um, and like with The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, um, that was a film about two Indigenous women living in a city um, and I hadn't seen too many representations of, of urban indigenous people on screen, especially um, experiences that kind of reflected my, my experience as an urban indigenous person. Um, and so with that film, we, we really strove to, um, to create a story that reflected the lived experience and the diversity of lived experience within the urban indigenous um, lived experience <laughs> yeah i think it varies but i think first and foremost for me as a storyteller it's always about my community first and foremost and my responsibility to my community uh, i can really quickly add on to that i agree um that's kind of um my mission as well as serve my community um, number one priority um, and the second priority is um, just depicting indigenous characters in a world that everyone else lives in you know what I mean um, uh, kind of getting a, in, from my you know obviously there's a balance there but trying to take away the tokenization of some things and put native people into just a contemporary setting where they can be native people. They don't have to be, um, uh, you know, representing every piece of their culture in the character they're portraying, you know, when I'm writing, um, but more of like the, well, they're a part of the larger community. That seems like a, just a really important goal to me is like, so people, um, I think that change of mind and seeing people on screen, native people on screen is, that's an important step, you know, like they're just they're people like everybody else they have different experiences that are but we still have more in common than we have i know that that are different i think what um when i'm you know you know casting or um uh, a doc finding a subject or even writing um a native character um I just really want to find somebody who's kind of who's who's lived. Um, I want to see uh, flaws. I want to see humor, um, and just something that you know, somebody who's just really excites me. Um, I think that uh, you know, although you know, many people will not you know meet somebody who you know may look or um, sound like a character that I've written. Um, it's just, you know, as long as I'm being truthful to that character um, and and um, with their dialogue and their mannerisms, and I feel that that's, you know, authentic. Um, and I hate using that word authentic, but um, it's just, um, it's, uh, it's, it's really what I, what I see. And um, I, I, I know I get like a lot of, um, like, when I, you know, with my script, 
my current script that I'm, I'm, I'm writing, um, it's, uh, you know, they're like, why is this script? Can, can and I and I and I go on the balance between you know there's like you know can natives be you know like showgirls like Nomi Malone in Showgirls can there be a native character yes there can hell yeah there can you know there can there be Native American golden girls hell yeah there can be golden girls you know um, and I think that you know we don't necessarily need to um, kind of I guess address kind of. I, I, that's where I get tricky. Like positive, you know, everything's very positive of, of native, you know, characters. And it has to be, you know, it's positive. You know, um, I want to see a native, you know, ha uh, Hannibal Lecter one day. You know, I want to see a Jason, um, Freddy Krueger. I want to see these. You know, so that they're native. Yeah, but um, yeah, I'm talking all over the place right now. But I just think that you know, it's like we're we're saying it now. It's just. Um, it's just who we create and who we who we write. I think that's just authentic. And I hate that word again, hey, authentic. Well, all right. Uh, we are coming up on our hour. Um, and to make sure that we end on a very positive note, um, I wanted us to just sort of go around the the horn and talk about uh, future projects that you are allowed to talk about. Um, what's getting you excited? What's coming down the pike? What can we look forward to seeing from everybody? Um, I I can't talk too much about my, my things, but I, I think I'm allowed to say that I have two projects in development with ABC and I have a third project set up at UCP. Um, all three of them are uh, extremely native and it's crazy that people are giving me money for this stuff. I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do this alphabetical just the, the way we um, started it off. So Billy, do you want to lead us on this one? Yeah, um, I'm um, going to be uh, right now, I'm in development um, with my feature Freiburg Facing Me. Um, that went just went through the labs um, this past year. Um, and also have the docu-series, the powwow circuit, um, that's really exciting. Um, and then just working on that um, Miss Navajo feature that I've been <laughs> in the past 15 years trying to get off and it's finally going, so yeah. Amazing, um, Elamaya. Um, I am finishing up a, a feature length doc um, called Kimabi Bitsen, uh, which is about my Blackfoot community's response to the opioid crisis. Um, it's been f almost five years in the making and I'm immensely proud of, of my community and all of the hard work that's, hap that's been happening to find solutions. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a really, beautiful portrait of a community that I am, again, like so immensely proud to be a part of. Um, and I'm also in development on my next narrative feature. It's um, an adaptation of, of a novella by an Indigenous Australian author named Ellen Van Nierven. Um, and it's a bit of like an environmental thriller, um, queer love story it's it's a little bit of everything it's kind of a wild story but yeah those are the the two main um, focuses right now fantastic um jeremy i think you're up oh yeah um well yeah um as mentioned we we do a lot of doc work so there's plenty of uh, documentary work coming up but i'm really putting a lot of energy into uh, a two tv series that i'm pitching uh, one's called White Killer, and it's uh, all set in Cherokee Nation. It's a supernatural crime thriller, and I'm pretty excited to start trotting that out and hope to get some attention for that. It's ready to go. Uh, and also have another TV series called Black Wind that involves, um, uh, obviously involves some Native uh, characters, but it's also based around Woody Guthrie and kind of it's a period and race relations of the time, which was a wild time in the 1920s. Um, and uh, we're, we are have created a, a Cherokee language cartoon called Inage. Um, we released the pilot last year, but we are actually in production on more episodes of that. And it's really, really fun. Um, 
And I'm really uh, crossing my fingers, starting to get traction on the co-production partner for that um, with some children's programming, some streamers. Uh, really, really hoping that works out because uh, it would be amazing to have a, a Cherokee property on a major streaming uh, service. And other than that, um, lots of you know, short films are in the hopper and uh, there's all kinds of fun stuff. Fantastic. Uh, Kyle. Yeah, for me, um, right now I'm just trying to finish up post on my first short narrative film called Spirits uh, that went through the labs in 2019. Um, I have another short film I'm working on right now uh, based on a native guitarist, uh, Jesse Ed Davis uh, from Oklahoma I'm working on. Um, I'm also putting ideas together for my first feature, so that's still in development. Um, yeah, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, with the pandemic and see how everything plays out, I'll be able to uh, get out to New York and get on set with Spike. I think he's supposed to be shooting his new film sometime soon, but other than that, yeah, just staying busy. Well, fantastic. Um, I wanted to thank all of our panelists for the generosity of their their time and their insight. Um, this was so wonderful um, connecting and talking with everybody. Um, I wanted to again thank the Sundance Film Festival, the Cherokee Nation Film Office, uh, Circle Cinema in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I uh, thank you all so much for facilitating these conversations and Thank you so much to anybody who tuned in. Watch more stuff with natives.